Okay, um, good morning everyone. Uh, we start our morning session of the second day of the conference. In the morning, we will have two speakers, uh, Professor Sanjeev Arora and uh, Professor Vera uh, Semenova. Let me quickly introduce uh, Professor Arora. Uh, he's well known beyond the uh, theoretical computer science community. So he doesn't really need an introduction. I will only briefly mention that he is a co-author of the popular textbook on computational complexity. And he is now investing a lot of efforts into machine learning. For instance, over the last three years, he has been pushing this frontier from the intellectually stimulating premises of the Institute for Advanced Study. Before we start an organizational note to the audience, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, in Zoom Q&A section or directly in Zoom chat. And we will deal with them in the end. Uh, uh, okay, let us open the second day and welcome Professor Sanjeev Arora. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, today's talk is about opening the black box, the black box of deep learning and how people are trying to get a mathematical understanding of it. So uh, deep learning is all uh, obviously in the news and we are all very interested in that. Um, Self-driving cars, playing Go, detecting cancer in x-rays, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so it's been so successful uh, in practice, but there are some very difficult mathematical questions uh, which we'll talk about and also why they are difficult. Uh, I'll give examples of mismatch between traditional frameworks of thinking about learning uh, and optimization and deep learning phenomena. And I'll give a survey of some understanding and new puzzles from recent years, and then I'll wrap up. So remember that uh, machine learning uh, is primarily like curve fitting, the classic curve fitting that we learned. Uh, namely, you have data and you're trying to fit some kind of a, uh, a curve to that data. Um, so machine learning is also like that, but it's surface fitting with many more variables, uh, millions or hundreds of millions or even a billion variables these days. So one statistical issue that arises in all of data science and also in machine learning is what does it mean to learn? And uh, the simplest definition of that, although now uh, research has given other definitions as well. But the simplest definition is that there is some fixed distribution on data points. So uh, the data point is input and label for a classification problem. And training uh, involves taking a random sample from this distribution and use it for training. So that's a training set. And now to test whether this model has learned, you check its output on a random holdout set, which is a proxy for estimating the train model's error on the full distribution. So this is also called test error. And if the test error is much more than the training error, then the model is overfitted. Training hasn't worked very well. It has failed to generalize. So the model did well on the training data, but didn't generalize to test data to the rest of the distribution. So uh, for today's talk, we'll just stay with this uh, simple definition of learning, although people are extending it to other definitions. So now deep nets, a quick reminder of uh, what are deep nets. So uh, for simplicity here, what I have is something called fully connected nets. Uh, so input comes in on the left. Um, so uh, on over here, can, can you see my pointer or not? Yes. Uh, and it comes in and you apply linear transformation matrix M1 and you get M1 times X. And then it pa you pass it through a non-linearity, then you get a vector X2. You pass it through another matrix linear transformation, you get M2, X2, et cetera. And, uh, and at the output, you get some, uh, some uh, number or vector. And theta here is a set of parameters in this net, which is the matrices. So the entries in these matrices. And the simplest nonlinearity that's used is what's called ReLU, rectified linear, where given a vector, you turn all negative entries to zero. 
Okay, uh, and I, as I mentioned, this is a very simplistic view of deep nets. You, uh, modern deep nets have uh, other features like convolution, bias, skip connections, many other loss functions, not least square, et cetera. But uh, the talk for the most part will not need those, uh, uh, that detailed description. So uh, yeah, you have training data, uh, pairs of uh, vectors X and Y, sorry, there's X one here, but it's X. And the loss I'm assuming is least square. So in order to train this net, uh, you try to make this loss small. So you change the parameters theta so that this loss becomes small. And so the uh, algorithm is gradient descent that, that's used universally, where you move theta always in the direction op opposite to the gradient of the loss. The gradient is the direction where the loss increases the fastest. So uh, you move in the direction opposite of that, make little steps. And the, and the famous backpropagation algorithm computes this gradient for this network because this network is a composition of various transformations and you use chain rule. Uh, in, in back propagation. So uh, this, uh, I've only shown this very simple net, but as I indicated, there's a, a much bigger paradigm of deep learning now uh, with many different architectures and there's fully general uh, paradigm is called differential, differentiable computing. Sorry, I shouldn't call it differential, differentiable computing, uh, where you can chain together these units and just do back propagation through the chained unit. All right. so. What is the counterintuitive thing about all of this? So let's view it very simplistically and then it will be clear. So you have these N actions, different layers and the input passes through that and the output comes out. Let's say zero for dog and one for cat. You're uh, inputting pictures into this net. And these parameters in the various layers are you can think of as knobs, kind of like knobs in, that radios have in the car. Um, but so, and, and gradient descent is just uh, using uh, a large training set of labeled inputs and adjusting the tunable knobs to make the net's output match the labeled outputs as closely as possible. Now, the complication here compared to the car radio is that the knobs action depends on all the other knobs. So if you change one knob, and then when you go back and look at the other knob, you know, its action has changed. So that's, uh, all of these knobs are inter interrelated. And that's why this is a very, counterintuitive fact, counterintuitive phenomenon that this simple tuning algorithm can work in practice. So that's the first mystery, that gradient descent, uh, which I'll call GD, quickly makes the training loss zero for these very large nets with large data sets. And here I illustrate gradient descent. So gradient descent is this uh, algorithm where at the teeth step, you make a small uh, um, uh, step uh, given by eta, uh, which is a step size in the direction of negative of the gradient. So on this uh, picture on the left, you see an example of what's called the loss landscape. You have two parameters. These are indicated by the knobs and the loss function is the third uh, coordinate. And this contour is giving the value of the loss function for different uh, combinations of the knobs. And you start from some random point in this landscape. So random setting of the knobs. Uh, and then you do this gradient descent. And so you follow along some path, some trajectory, and end up at some point where you can't move very much anymore, and that's where you stop. Very simple and even naive algorithm. Uh, and the reason this is, uh, this is so counterintuitive that this works is that this landscape, as you can see in this picture already, is non-convex. So something more like this rather than convex. And so in a non-convex landscape, as you can see even by inspection, where you start from and what exact path you take really determines where you end up. So there's not a unique place you could end up because you're starting from a random uh, starting point. So uh, it's kind of counterintuitive that this landscape is so well behaved that gradient descent points very good solutions. Now, so that's you know about training. As, as I mentioned at the start, there's also the issue of how well that training has worked. How good is this model on held out data. So that's the second mystery uh, about deep nets concerning overfitting. So as we recall in just all of statistics, if you use a very complicated model, uh, like something like this, instead of the linear model, you will overfit. You'll fit on the training data, but not do well on the held out data. 
And this is, of course, the classic Occam's razor that you want to use the simplest possible explanation for data. All right, so, and uh, the mystery here in today's deep learning is that the nets are way over parameterized. So you may have 50,000 training examples and 50 million parameters in the net. So way, way more, several orders of magnitude more parameters and data points. And somehow these highly over parameterized nets outperform smaller models. So in other words, it's like in the Sherlock Holmes uh, story, you know, the mystery is not that the dog barked, but that the dog did not bark. So the mystery is no overfitting. So there are many other mysteries, some are later in the talk uh, that we'll talk about. So let's talk about the hurdles for theory in this field. So the, the hurdle is, the main hurdle is that the loss function is currently a black box to mathematics, since it depends on complicated training data, like dog versus cat, English to German, et cetera. So the black box, so the loss function is known, we have the expression for it, but as far as mathematics is concerned, we don't understand that function because it's talking about, you know, what makes this picture or this set of pixels a picture of a dog. And we don't have any mathematical characterization of that. So we might as well think of it as a black box as far as mathematics is concerned. But the trouble is that we know that no fruitful theory is possible for black box that is fully general non-convex function. You can show that there's no efficient algorithm to find optima, let alone optima that generalize. So you have to open the black box in order to do any theory. Now, here's another thing that's become very clear to me, which is that this optimization viewpoint that everybody uses, uh, which I showed in the previous slides, it's not even clear to me that it's the right language for even understanding the current deep learning. So what do I mean by that? So by optimization, I mean the following, that optimization is concerned with minimizing a loss function, finding optima, and doing it as fast as possible because we are interested in, uh, in fast algorithms. So if you interpret optimization in this, in this way, you know, just that it does this, it's not even, not even clear it's the right language for understanding deep learning. So to illustrate what I mean, let me recall the old debate in neuroscience. You know, does the brain, which is just a spike, which is spiking neurons in a vat of chemicals, amount to optimi optimization of an objective? And that's still an open question in neuroscience. And the suggestion today is that deep net training is also very imperfectly captured by the value of the objective. And the reason is that there are multiple minima. There are, as I indicated in the picture, there are many uh, optima. And, uh, and certainly if you throw in local optima, there are even many more. And you're starting from a random point in gradient descent. And if you do any tweak to the training, there are all kinds of tweaks that are known in gradient descent. You're going on a different trajectory with a different solution. So therefore, uh, it's the trajectory properties that determine where you end up. In other words, whether or not there's generalization. So that's sort of missing from this narrow view of what optimization is, right? The, what, what trajectory you follow is almost not important in, in traditional optimization. Just what matters is the value and how fast you got there. So this is a, a phenomenon that many theorists have uh, focused on in recent uh, uh, years. And uh, there's a very nice phrase, implicit bias of gradient descent uh, that came out of the group at TTI Chicago. Uh, and uh, so we'll talk more about this. All right, so the agenda for theory is to open the black box, this black box of deep learning. As you saw, the, the paradigm, the computational paradigm is just to treat it as a black box. You just do gradient descent on this loss. You don't try to understand it. But in order to do theory, you have to open the black box. And so the, the hope is that you'll gradually analyze more and more complicated deep nets and see if theory can explain these mysteries that I alluded to earlier. And uh, an example, just to give an example, uh, you know, an analysis, maybe you understand trajectory of gradient descent for a three layer net on some simple data set. 
And just understand, you know, by looking at the trajectory and understanding how the trajectory evolves, this process of reaching zero loss and good generalization on that simple data set. Even that is currently fairly difficult. And the difficulty is that what we're talking about are notoriously hard problems in mathematics, like evolution of systems of tens of millions of parameters uh, and how they evolve on the gradient descent. These are quite close to famous unsolved problems in mathematics. Uh, and yeah, uh, as was alluded to, I was at the Institute for Advanced City for the last three years, running a program there. And yeah, I talked to, uh, to math mathematicians and physicists to try to get ideas for how to proceed in this. And it was clear that there aren't really techniques out there to deal with this. So we have to roll up our sleeves and just uh, create this mathematics. So I'll, uh, in the rest of the talk, I'll give you some vignettes of uh, some results that have been achieved. Uh, and it'll give you a taste of where this field is going. So the first vignette is training of infinitely wide deep nets. Now, infinitely wide, I'll describe in a second, but as the name suggests, it's some kind of infinite limit, as you see in physics. So like thermodynamic limit in physics, or there's a Gaussian process view of deep learning, et cetera. The point here is because it's the size of the net is going to infinity, there are infinitely many solutions and somehow Gray Anderson picks out an interesting and meaningful solution. So what do I mean by an infinite net? I'll illustrate with a very simple example. So suppose the input is very simple. It's 17 dimensional, tiny input. Uh, number of training samples is 339. I, I took this data set out of this classic UCI data set that was very popular a decade ago or two decades ago. All right, so we want to train fully connected five layer net on it. Seems a little bit of an overkill, but uh, all right. Now I'm gonna make it even more complicated and more uh, ridiculous. I'm going to make the net infinitely wide. So what does that mean? I'm going to keep the input and output layer fixed. So we, we can still feed the same input into the net and get some, the same kind of output, a real number but you allow the width of the inner layers to go to infinity. So it's, we're doing some kind of a mathematical limit and, and studying the behavior as it goes to infinity. And this infinitely, infinite net is scaled with, uh, initialized with some suitably scaled Gaussian, so the expected node value makes sense. All right, so you look at this and you say, well, this is too expressive. We know that even if you make even two layer nets arbitrarily wide, they can represent every finite function. So the number of zero loss solutions will go to infinity. Uh, plus it's infinite, so it's infeasible to train. So this is not a realistic net. True, but turns out you can train it. And the answer on this data set, the tumor data set is that the test accuracy is 51.5. Remember this multi-class. So 51% accuracy is actually reasonable. And the interesting thing is that the old champions for small data tasks like random forest and Gaussian kernels do a little bit worse. So this actually is a pretty decent model for small data examples. Similarly for CIFAR 10, you can, do, you can calculate what the infinite convolutional net is doing. All right, so what is the motivation for this infinite limit and, uh, and what exactly is going on? So, Remember the original thermodynamic limit in physics. So, you know, molecular motion in gas. And at every time step, uh, you know, there's finite number of molecules and there's some kind of a variation about a distribution. So there's the velocity distribution is changing. It's time varying. And the insight in the 19th century was that if you go to the infinite limit, this distribution of velocities and energies uh, reaches some kind of a limit and uh, you can calculate that limit by calculus. So something similar happens with neural nets. And what you can show is that the following are equivalent for any finite data set. You have an infinitely, infinite width fully connected net or convolutional net, there's a theorem for that too. Trained with gradient descent with infinitesimally small learning rate. So that's one model, the one I just described. And the second is kernel L2 regression, which is a classic machine learning idea with respect to a new kernel called the neural tangent kernel which is in the title, or convolutional neural tangent kernel. And in this paper that I mentioned on the first slide, 
we gave an efficient and GPU friendly uh, algorithm for computing this convolutional kernel exactly using dynamic programming. And the idea in this theorem and this algorithm is that, as I alluded to earlier in the thermodynamic limit, the distribution of values at a layer approaches some uh, fixed distribution and you can compute that by dynamic programming. So now uh, this classic kernel uh, regression idea uh, with a new kernel can be used to compute the exact performance of infinite width net nets on finite data sets. So I just want to unpack the previous slide a little bit. So this is um, a reminder about what kernel linear regression is. So um, you, you have the input X and you're going to lift it to an infinite dimensional space via some mapping phi. So phi of X is some vector in an infinite dimensional uh, Hilbert space. And uh, there are various popular kernels, pol polynomial kernel, Gaussian kernel, et cetera. And now you, you're going to do classification using this infinitely long uh, representation. And the kernel trick in machine learning says that you can do machine learning on this infinitely large vector if you can, uh, certainly regression, you can do regression if you can compute inner product of phi of x1 and phi x2 for any two data points, x1 and x2. So that's all you need to do regression with this infinitely large representation. And the neural tangent kernel is just some new kernel where in phi of x, this uh, Hilbert space, each coordinate corresponds to a parameter w in the net. And remember the number of parameters is going to infinity. And the corresponding entry is the partial derivative of the output with respect to the parameter at time t equals zero. So to do regression, you only need uh, an algorithm to compute this in a product, which is what our dynamic programming algorithm does. And here's the, uh, the result I alluded to earlier that um, uh, on this classic uh, UCI data sets, we took 90 uh, data sets that had been studied before in this earlier paper. And there they found that the old champions were random forests and Gaussian kernels and the neural tangent kernel beats those old champions by a little bit. All right, and you can also do a souped up uh, version of the tangent kernel for convolutional nets. And now for the first time, you got a kernel that beats the original Hinton paper or matches the original Hinton paper on CIFAR 10, which is a, a well-known data set in vision. Now, so now we've shown that at least in the infinite limit, deep nets become the simpler model. But uh, now that we realize it, people have gone back and looked at generalization for kernels and realized that actually the generalization results even for kernels were not very well understood. So that's another interesting open area at this point. So I'll, uh, I'll, I can take a couple of questions here before I go to the next vignette. Any questions in the chat box? There is one question in the chat box actually, uh, yeah. uh, very uh, relevant. Uh, so it's a technical clarification. So what do you mean by exact performance? You can compute the output of this infinitely wide net on any, on any data point. It's infinitely wide, but by dynamic programming, you can compute the output. Okay, uh, no other questions so far. Okay, so in general, yeah, I'll, I can take pauses for a question or two after each vignette. I know we've got one. Um, okay. What do you mean by entry on the previous slide? Oh, uh, so this one, you know, so and on the left, I have the, uh, this input and then this kernel uh, representation, phi of x. So this is the coordinate. Oh, I see, uh, by uh, the, the entry in that coordinate in phi of x, that's what I mean. The vector with real values and the corresponding real value is this. Okay, while we are at it, another question. What, okay. how, how do you calculate accuracy for regression? Okay, so um, the, uh, what we're doing here in training is uh, L2 loss, but at test time, we are actually uh, looking at classification loss. So what okay. you would want to do, yeah. The, the reason we're using L2 instead of some other losses that the, uh, this NTK theory is not fully developed for all kinds of losses. 
L2 is the simplest. Okay, one last question and then we proceed. How does the statistics of the input affect the trajectory? Is there something special about the statistics of the input? Totally. I think the input is very important. I emphasized this when I said, you know, the, that this function is a black box. It depends on the input and that's a black box. Like what are, what are the properties of the input? So it's definitely very, very much dependent on the properties of the input, but mathematics doesn't currently have a way of describing how, like what are the properties of inputs? Like what makes a bunch of pixels a picture of a dog, right? The only good description we have mathematically is a deep net that we've trained. Okay. All right, so second vignette, solving matrix completion via deep linear nets. And the subtext here is that gradient descent is amazing, even in very simple models. You don't need a very fancy net to see this effect, but exactly mathematically formalizing its effect can be tricky. So this is a paper implicit regularization, deep matrix factorization. So matrix completion is the following simple problem that there is an unknown low rank N by N matrix M, capital M, and entries are revealed in a random subset omega of locations and the goal is to recover this matrix. So I, I forgot to say that this, this became popular about uh, 13 years ago uh, as a result of this so-called Netflix problem where the company was trying to predict how well would a user like a movie and it has some partial, so that, that's this matrix user by user times movies and the company only knows a few entries in this matrix that the user has rated and was once to break the other entries. So that's where this problem uh, came from and became very popular. And uh, the algorithm uh, that everybody settled on was this so-called nuclear norm minimization. So you're finding the matrix with the best squared error. So the revealed entries are omega and M is a matrix you're trying to find. So you're trying, trying to minimize the least square error between the revealed entries and the entries of the matrix you find. And then you add this other term in the in the objective, which is called the regularizer, which is the nuclear norm, the sum of singular values of M. So you're finding a matrix with small nuclear norm, that's what this is saying, which fits the revealed entries. So there's some kind of a continuous relaxation of uh, low rank and Candace and Rex shows that this convex relaxation is statistically optimal and it's convex so you can solve it exactly. Wonderful. So. 10, uh, more than 10 years later, about uh, a decade later, people revisit, revisited that and this lovely paper of Gunasekhar et al. Uh, said, okay, suppose we forget about this regularizer and convex and everything. You know, with modern, in, in the modern era, we're just willing to solve non-convex problems anyway. So just find M as a product of two matrices. So what's called a depth two linear net. So now instead of M, you have W2 times W1. So that's your matrix and you're just uh, fitting it to the revealed entries. No regularizer. So now you just do gradient descent. Now, there are infinitely many solutions, right? There are these product of two matrices. There are many possibilities, including those that fit the revealed entries because there's no rank constraint at all. However, they found that empirically gradient descent finds solutions as good as the nuclear norm minimization. So there was no need to go to this more complicated relaxation, just do gradient descent. And so their conjecture was that in depth two linear nets, gradient descent is implicitly minimi minimizing the nuclear norm. So that's an example of the implicit bias of gradient descent. It's doing something interesting mathematically. Well, so in our paper, we study, we tried to study this conjecture and we first decided to go deeper. So like more than two layers. So now you have N layers and the matrix you're trying to find is a product of M, N matrices, W1 through WN. And this entire product of matrices, you can think of it as a, deep, as a linear net where you're just applying a sequence of linear transformations. And, uh, and, and this N to N matrix is the product of matrices uh, and you're just fitting it to the revealed entries. So it's taking this deep learning paradigm to the limit, right? The, we have a problem for which we had a good solution that we thought was statistically optimal. We're going to ignore all that domain knowledge about low rank and nuclear norms. And we're just going to trust back propagation, simple gradient descent. Now, here's the first good news. Empirically, this solves matrix completion better. That is with fewer revealed entries than nuclear norm minimization. And there's a mathematical explanation for it. 
Now you might be saying, wait, I said that people had shown that nuclear non minimization was statistically optimal, but it's only optimal as emphatically, like, you know, up to some constant factor. And that constant factor is better for this algorithm. So uh, you see the, like on the left, you see depth two, which is like nuclear non minimization. Depth three is in this case, a lot better. And depth four is just slightly better. All right. So, and there's a mathematical analysis we could do. You know, we could analyze this as a, what I alluded to the, as this system of differential e equations or evolution of these parameters. And we can analyze how this end-to-end -end matrix is evolving. And what we see is that there's some rich get richer phenomenon that the large singular values that somehow get a little bit large tend to grow very fast. And that's what gives it the tendency to be low rank because the, the few large singular values keep getting bigger and bigger. And so the matrix tends to get low rank. All right, so inter the interpretation is that the gradient descent is building up the matrix one singular vector at a time, not all at once. And this building stops when the gradient of loss goes to zero. So that's the way in which this low, low rank evolves. All right, so it turns out there's evidence that the gunasekar conjecture is false and there's been subsequent work that shows actually it is false. Any questions here? Well, we have a question. Uh, it's a little bit vague. Uh, how are you calculating? Uh, uh, can we perform simulation study to answer accuracy issues? These are simulation studies. I do have the plots here, uh, but this is on synthetic data. That's it. Okay, so the third vignette uh, is exponentially increasing learning rate. <laughs> this works for deep learning. So this is uh, uh, something that I found quite surprising, a paper with student Jian Li. So remember gradient descent, you're updating the parameter vector in the, in the direction of negative of the gradient, but uh, the mag magnitude of the step is the step size, eta. So that's called the learning rate or the step size, and that's, plays a key role in optimization and machine learning. And there's a big field of papers on this. And the standard schedule in deep learning people have ended up with is that you start with some learning rate and decay over time. There's some extensive literature and optimization that justifies this. Although there's been some lately, some papers in the last couple of years suggesting that there's something wrong with this for modern deep nets that you can have deep uh, learning rates that oscillate and so on like cosine. And that's also, uh, that's okay. Well, so what we do, what we show is something very surprising. So the first result is just purely empirical. It's possible to train today's state-of-the-art deep architectures while growing the learning rate exponentially. So at every iteration, you're multiplying the learning rate by one plus C for some C bigger than zero. Now I know all of you know about exponential <laughs> increase. So indeed, what this is saying is that with, you know, because it's uh, the training is going for thousands of iterations and uh, Remember that an iteration involves only a small batch of input. So that's why there are a lot of iterations. Um, at the end of the training, the learning rate goes to billions or trillions. You need full precision arithmetic to even keep track of it. So it's massive, the learning rate, but somehow the training works. Why did we even try such a crazy experiment? <laughs> we tried it because we had the theory. We knew that this would work. So we, had, we have a mathematical proof that nets produced by existing training schedules, you know, which have something like this, this form that I show, can also be obtained in function space. So not in the same parameter space, but in function space, meaning the input output behavior via such exponential learning rate schedules. So that's a mathematical theorem that uh, you can do training of today's deep nets via these very counterintuitive training schedules. And and this happens in all these nets that use batch norm or other layer normalization schemes. And that's, that holds for most state-of-the-art nets today. So I won't describe batch norm, uh, but it's some normalization idea and which uh, turns out has mathematical properties that allow this kinds of exponential learning rates. So I'll explain that uh, uh, this uh, mathematically what this means, exponential learning rate. So the general training algorithm for deep learning today is that um, 
you have something called momentum, which is some kind of memory of past learning rates. Uh, and um, uh, you have the L2 regularizer, what's called weight decay. So this is a uh, regularizer which penalizes the L2 norm of the, or the square L2 norm of the parameters. And there's a learning rate. All right, so the informal theorem is that for above uh, nets, you know, with this kind of uh, training uh, algorithm, the following is equivalent to above. You zero out the weight decay parameter, this, this lambda parameter. Momentum stays unchanged. And the learning rate schedule becomes this exponential learning rate, where alpha is a non-zero root of this quadratic equation. And this non-zero root is well-behaved, you can show. Okay, so that's the, that's how you uh, get exponential learning rates. Basically, you make the weight decay zero. All right, and the proof uses a trajectory-based analysis, as I was alluding to earlier, that we have to understand trajectories of training. It's not just an optimization question. Uh, and the scale invariance created due to batch norm. Okay, so scale invariance is that uh, the net represented by parameter vector theta is the same as a net um, uh, given by parameter scaled up by a constant c. And so that has certain properties about the gradient that the gradient also scales by some constant when you change the parameter vector. And then we can give a mathematical proof that the two trajectories I mentioned are actually equivalent by an induction over time. All right, so uh, that's what I had to say about learning rates. Any questions? I actually have a question about learning rates. I've yeah. seen a paper uh, which argues that, uh, uh, well, we don't really see the point of uh, using decreased learning rates. So, uh, we are going to use flat learning rate and they did fine. And it looks like with your uh, logic. Flat, I don't, I don't, um, in which setting? I'm not sure that's true. What, uh, flat, really small flat or really big flat? Uh, well, I, it's I, probably, I, I, it's probably very small flat. So that we have a paper to uh, explain that phenomenon, which I haven't, I mean, it's not out yet. Uh, uh, it's not even an archive, so I didn't talk about it. But uh, yeah, so there's definitely interesting stuff going on. You can do things with constant learning rate as well, uh, which is a different paper. Um, but but you can't keep it large and constant. So if you so it's still true that if you want efficient training, you have to start with a large learning rate and go to small, as far as I know, in all the current schedules. Okay, we have another question. Is this result true for all type of neural networks or only for matrix multiplications with identity activation? Function? Oh, this is not this is not linear nets. This is state of the art nets, as I was saying, state of the art. Yeah, state of the art, uh, you know, res nets, dense nets, etc. Applies to all of them because they're using some kind of normalization, which which produces a scale invariance. Okay, so I'll, I'll now get to the last vignette, which is how to allow deep learning on your data without revealing your data. And this is this paper in ICML uh, with Huang, uh, Yang Siwo Huang, Zhao Song, and Kai Li. Okay, so preamble. Okay, so, uh, uh, so obviously this is some kind of a theory question. It's reminiscent of cryptography that you may have seen and uh, uh, cryptography has tried to exactly give you primitives like this, right? You can do online transactions without revealing your credit card number, et cetera. So now we want to do deep learning on without revealing your data. And people have been thinking about it. But before I do that, let me give you the preamble why we got to it. Because as I said, we're trying to understand deep learning and trajectory and so on in landscape. So this is very bizarre uh, method uh, called mix-up. It's, it's a data augmentation method. So if you, uh, uh, you have a certain training data set, uh, let's say n data points, and data augmentation converts n training points to more training points. That's why it's called augmentation. And mix-up is a very funny one. So the idea is you're going to teach this deep model, right, which is nonlinear and so on, to behave linearly on training data. So what do I mean by that? Images, think of them as vectors in minus one, one to the D, you know, the coordinates are pixels, pixel values, rescale to minus one, one. 
And labels are one hot vectors in C dimensions, where C is a number of classes. So if images come from C classes, C, they're C labels, you're going to think of the label as a one hot vector. So it's zero everywhere except the one coordinate, which is the correct label. So uh, mix up is the following. You're going to take convex combination of images and also convex combination of labels, these label vectors, okay? And you're going to train the net to produce that mixed label on this mixed image. So in pictures, you may have the picture of a cat. This is from CIFAR 10, you know, these pixelated images. You're taking 0.6 times this cat image. You're taking the car image, 0.4 times the car image. And you mix them up as vectors. It's vector sum, coordinate wise. Each pixel is added like this. And you get this combined picture where you can, if you squint, you can see both the cat and the car. And the label is mixed too. So you're going to train the deep net on only these mixed up images. Now, of course, no human ever learned to, to see and label using mixed up images. Well, but you train the deep net with only these mixed data points. And surprisingly enough, when you test it at the end on normal images, it does better. It's only been trained on these mixed data points, but it, it does better on normal images than, than the usual deep net. So it's very bizarre that somehow training the deep model to behave linearly in this way, this counterintuitive way, uh, improves its accuracy. So we've been trying to understand this and I don't have theory for it. But at some point we realized that we could use this phenomenon in an interesting way in the security framework. So the takeaway from this slide is that the training data is malleable. Like in all of statistics and machine learning, you think of data as what's given to you. You don't mess with the data. The data is the data. But this says, don't think of data as unchangeable. It's malleable. You can mix it up and do things, operations on the data. All right, so now we get to the privacy problem. So uh, a, a, a standard issue, a standard example for why you need privacy while, while in doing deep learning is that there are multiple parties with private data which want to collaboratively train a deep model, like hospitals. Or think of Google Keyboard. You, you want to uh, train it using your text and maybe your friend's text, but you don't want to reveal your private data to Google. So uh, ideally, that's, what, that's the kind of functionality you would like. And so in such settings, there's a framework called federated learning where the server shares the current model with the party. So the server is training the deep net. And every step, it just shares the current model with the parties. So it has the model and it shares the model. And the parties update the model. They compute the gradient on this model using the data and send the gradient updates back. So that's the federated learning with private data. So the parties hold on to the data. Now, this is not really secure because the uh, the, the gradients that the parties are sending back contain information about the input. And in fact, there are attacks showing that you can recover the inputs from the gradients. You may have seen some of those attacks. So one approach to build in some privacy is the popular differential privacy uh, approach, where each party shares model gradients computed using their data, but after adding noise to it. So this is the differential privacy. Now the pros of this is that there's provable privacy guarantees. And the cons is that there's large accuracy drop due to the added noise. Approach two, full-blown cryptography. So uh, differential privacy is just adding some noise. This is full-blown cr cryptography, multi-party computation. You can uh, give the strongest possible privacy guarantees, but the cons is very high computational overhead. Roughly what happens is that these cryptographic ideas break down all the arithmetic computation during deep learning into some finite field computations. And that's just very high overhead. It's infeasible for modern deep learning to do it at scale. So clearly we need an encryption method for data for this deep learning uh, uh, application, which does not interfere with deep learning in contrast to usual cryptography, which lifts arithmetic operations to finite fields or lattices. So we decided to take inspiration from MixUp. So why is mix up uh, some inspiration for hiding information? So th this is because you, uh, you, can comp you can get computationally hard problems out of just mixing up vectors. So here's a K vector subset sum problem. So you have a set of K N public vectors, V1 through Vn. 
And if you just pick K of them, K is something small like five or 10, secret indices out of this and release the sum of the corresponding vectors. Okay, so pick five random indices and output the sum of those or 10 random indices, and output the sum of those. Now the exponential time hypothesis and complexity theory says that finding these secret indices for somebody else should require a lot of time depending on the size of the public data set of vectors. So even k equals four, for instance, is pretty hard. You know, if n is large, like if n is 100 million, which is not so difficult, right? Public images out there on the internet. Uh, this is, n is pretty large. And so this is a tough problem. So here's the insta height idea. So we want to do deep learning, but we don't want to reveal our data. So here's a private data point, this cat image. We're going to mix it up with images from a public data set, which everybody knows. Instagram or ImageNet or something. So what this means is that I've taken the cat image with its label, this one hot vector. And I've taken a bunch of public data set images. These are, not, these are not labeled, these are just images. And I mix them up with the private image. Why public data set? So we can have a large data set, which nobody needs to like store on their hard drive. They can just get it off the web uh, as they need images. And uh, there's no special preparation, no setup, as opposed to many cryptographic ideas where you need some kind of a setup, uh, like a certainly public key uh, infrastructure and so on. So the parties can just participate with no setup. And the large is so that you have more security because you know recovering mixed up uh, information out of mixed up vectors when k is, uh, when, when this data set is large becomes hard. Okay, so you mix it up and now you get this mix of the cat and the bird image and the label is still cat because the bird image was unlabeled. And then you flip si uh, signs randomly. Okay, so there's a one-time private key that's used only for this training image where you flip the sign randomly in this mixed image. So it hides it even more. So it becomes this kind of vector. Now this flipping of sign is, uh, is just a, analogous to a private key. Uh, in pri private key cryptography. Uh, the point of this flip is sign, pr flipping the sign is it's kind of like forgetting the sign. So that's all that's going on. So it's kind of a bizarre operation, this linear operation and then this sign flipping operation, which is multiplicative. In, in a longer talk, I'll give a little bit more background on why these are natural from a cryptographic viewpoint. But anyway, at the end of the day, this is the final install height uh, uh, method. You take K over two training images. So like car, cat and car, these images, add to them k over two um, uh, public images and, uh, and then mix it up and then flip the signs randomly. And now you're going to train only on these, these crazy images, which look like random pixels and with this labels. And somehow at the end, this uh, train net can do normal classification um, and uh, and at the same time, during training, you haven't revealed any of the images. So we conjecture that finding, extracting information about the training images out of this mixed up images is difficult. That's the conjecture. And this, this is not very secure, like you know, cryptography that you use for doing online transactions, but it scales much better. And you can do it with these very large images and large data sets and large neural nets. Okay, so I'll quickly conclude and then take more questions. So understanding why and how deep learning works is a new frontier for mathematics. Attempts to open the black box leads to new insights and new methods, for instance, exponentially increasing learning rates and insta height, and it'll be a fun ride. In the mathematics, there's no yeah, ignorabimus, as Hilbert said. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, we have uh, one question already. Uh, submitted, aren't pixels generally unsigned integers? So oh, you just what, shift them so that, they, uh, meaning uh, shift them so that they're minus one one. This is just for uh, convenience, yeah. yeah. In, in that example- want to flip the sign at the end, so the sign flipping. I mean, I could define sign flipping in a different way, but if you want to think of it as sign flipping, you want to change the coordinate system so that it have plus one and minus one, between plus one and minus one. Another question is about encryption. Uh, so uh, if you add random public pictures to encrypt the original, how do you decrypt it? You don't, you don't need to de decrypt. 
You only train the debt on those encrypted images. You never decrypt, right? So you encrypt it and you send that to the server. Server will not be able to decrypt it. That's what we believe. And nobody needs to decrypt it. You just train on the encrypted images. So you in principle cannot decrypt it. Nobody else can, you, you yourself to. can, you know which public images you use. But nobody ne else needs to, they just train on your encrypted images. Yeah, I, I see a confusing question. It's hard to interpret. Um, another, uh, okay, so we have a, a question in Q&A section. Are, are there good generalization errors, theoretical results for deep layers instead of wide ones? So there are no tight generalization results. So understanding rigorously the sample complexity, the number of samples you need to uh, train a large net uh, is, uh, is still an open problem, but uh, there are better generalization bounds. In the last four or five years, people have come up with a sequence of better methods to estimate the number of training samples. It's still not giving realistic bounds, but it's a lot better, orders of magnitude better than before. Thank you. Uh, another question, is there a loss of accuracy due to the encryption and how large? There, there is a small loss, yes, I forgot to mention that. Uh, yeah, there's a small loss in accuracy. And how large did it compare to other methods like to do? So differential privacy has a huge loss. Like uh, for CIFAR 10, uh, the best accuracy people have been able to get is 75%, which is, uh, which is worse than, you know, simple classic methods. So basically differential privacy, if you want provable guarantees, is not a viable method for deep learning in that setting. Yeah, this is not often mentioned. People use differential privacy a lot, but if you want to get provable bounds, you have to add so much noise that basically uh, the, the model becomes not so useful. Okay, we have another question. Uh, uh, I've read a paper from Yu, Yu, Yu Xin Yi. I've read a paper about explaining unsupervised learning by using statistical physics. Is it possible for, to, uh, for explaining more general case? So I didn't talk about unsupervised learning in this talk. Uh, there's all kinds of papers. I mean, explaining is a strong word uh, in any of these. You know, mostly what people are doing is either, you know, if you have a rigorous explanation, then it'll be a relatively simple model. Uh, and, if it's, uh, and if it's not rigorous, then you're using some heuristic from some statistical physics and so on, which sort of uh, resolve some of the hurdles for you, ansatz of some kind. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we do not have any new question at the moment. Great. Let's see if, if people come up with something. Sorry for the background noise. Looks like somebody's gardener is out next door. I, 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 I wonder what is your uh, general view on data augmentation besides uh, these privacy Access. issues, but like for, uh, for improving training or for regularization purposes? Um, yeah, so data augmentation is, uh, is very interesting, right? Especially the mix up. It suggests that deep nets uh, should behave almost linearly. And in fact, people have now stronger versions of mix up where they actually insist on linearity on the, on the intermediate layers, which helps even further a little bit. So um, it's very interesting. Um, there are some efforts to try to understand it, but uh, it's not clear why this works. And it doesn't feel like that's what animal vision is about, but somehow human vision, uh, machine vision is 
benefits from that. There is one uh, one technical comment that your off convex work files uh, size seems to be down. Yes, we are trying to uh, find out what's going on. I think it may be some kind of a domain naming error or something. We're, we're trying to track that down. We thank you. So should I mute myself? Well, we still technically we still have two minutes uh, for okay. your session. So let's let's uh, if there are other questions, give people a chance. Yeah, especially given that we started a little bit later. Okay. Yeah, I was trying to finish by eleven ten, so <laughs> uh, that's fine. Ah, well, okay, we, we have a question. Um, how safe is the encryption? How hard is it for the server to uncover your data? So it's not as secure, I think, as normal cryptography, uh, you know, which just to decrypt your credit card number will take whatever millions of years. So uh, it's just not easy for the server to do it, you know, so you could use public images that, uh, you know, with the, the, a very large set of public images. So, and uh, you could even use images from a GAN uh, generator model. So you could mix with all kinds of things and uh, for the server to figure out the original inputs right now seems to require a lot of computation. So it, it would just impose a big cost on the server but it's not completely undoable. Uh, if you have, you know, a hundred million images, it's conceivable that the server could try all possible combinations. It's just not very feasible right now. Okay, we're done with questions for now. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Thank you.